thank you for joining us today on The Happiness Quest. My name is Jess Dutel from the Center for Transformation at Plymouth State University. And I'm Dr. Maria Sanders, a philosophy professor at Plymouth State University and CEO of Philosophy for Life. And so today on Happiness Quest, we're going to talk about the impact perfection has on happiness. Uh, and interestingly, we've mentioned eudaimonia, the mm -hmm. ancient Greek concept, quite frequently on this show. Uh, and in particular, Aristotle's version of eudaimonia. Uh, to a certain extent, Aristotle may share in some of the blame of this obsession towards perfection and trying to achieve perfectionism, uh, but it's being taken out of context. Uh, when Aristotle uh, thought about the ultimate purpose that human beings have, what we strive for in life, uh, he had uh, what we would call a teleological system, and telos is just a fancy word for purpose. So he felt everything and everyone had a purpose. So like, for example, my pen has a purpose to write. Of course. Uh, human beings, we have a purpose. In fact, we have purposes. There are multiple purposes. Uh, maybe I want to strive for fame. Maybe I want to strive for honor. Maybe it's wealth uh, and success in my society. And it's unique to all of us. It, to those independent variables are unique, mm -hmm. even though there's some commonality. But ultimately what Aristotle recognized is when you drill down, all human beings are really striving for ultimately the same thing. And that's where he used this term eudaimonia. Mm -hmm. uh, today we clumsily translate it to mean happiness, but it really doesn't fit our current depiction of happiness. It's more of this full and flourishing life. Uh, so a um, a very intentional, meaningful approach to living. But he did quite often refer to the perfect life when he referred to happiness. And perfection was one of the variables uh, that he felt happiness had to possess. Mm -hmm. um, so it didn't matter if the individual was looking for wealth or for honor, for fame. If you went to why they were looking for those things, ultimately it was to be happy. And so he viewed happiness as the final good, the final goal uh, for human beings. Uh, and that's how he used this term perfect. He viewed the perfect life as the complete life. Um, but it does have this very strong finality to it. it. It almost has a sense of an all or nothing. Did I live the complete life? And when we think about it in the context of happiness, uh, it ends up having a bit of an odd rub uh, I can't really determine if I'm happy or not until my life is over, until it's complete. Right. And so when we think about the perfect life, what we're really asking ourselves when we look back on our life, again, once it's finished, did we live that full and flourishing life? Uh, much more difficult to use this term perfection in the moment, which again, ironically, is where we live in yeah. the present, the process. So perhaps a more useful uh, conception of this ideal life, even in its ideal state, would have more of a, a degree involved or an optimalism to it rather than this final perfectionism yes. of sorts. And I like Aristotle's definition of perfectionism associated with eudaimonia much more so than I think we have experienced in our current society because our definition that we're used to is more rigid, I well, it's think. it's very extreme. And it's extreme, And it Absolutely. almost sets us up for an addiction of sorts. Yes. We become addicted to striving for perfection. Right. And, and typically we feel like it's something external from us that we need exactly. to then gain. So I'm reading this great book. I have in the past um, mentioned, I am a self-proclaimed perfectionist, <laughs> but I'm a recovering perfectionist, right? So I'm more mindful about what that means in my life and the areas that it's useful and the areas that it's more harmful. So I'm reading this book called The Pursuit of Perfect by Tal Ben Shehar and uh, written by a professor who has taught at Harvard happiness courses. Happiness courses. Right? Yes, yeah. uh, he's a po positive psychologist. And so what he talks about is in psychology, there's this idea of negative perfectionism versus positive perfectionism. So striving to do your best is beneficial in many ways. Absolutely. But when it then becomes the extreme is when it's harmful, when we are rigidly focused on this idea of what we're trying to obtain and when for some reason it falls short of that, 
that can be very damaging to our psyche. You know, it reminds me a lot of uh, how we view stress. Yes. Same thing. There's a healthy level of stress. Yes. And then there's that line in the sand, so to speak, that yes. once we cross over it, it becomes an unhealthy, more anxiety-ridden type right. of stress. Right. And so explained in the book is instead of looking at perfectionism as positive or negative, really he separates out perfectionism in contrast to optimalism. So mm -hmm. I'm looking for the optimal like scenario. That. And I love that because that brings along me striving to live my best life without setting this unattainable goal, right? And if I have the goal, but I don't necessarily achieve it from point A to point B in a perfect straight line, that's okay because life is a journey and there are, there are bumps and detours along the way. And instead of just focusing on the end result, we can focus then on the journey. Well, and it is so extremely important when we think about it in the context of life, life really doesn't happen at the goal point. Right. Life happens between the goals. It's the process. It's an, a verb, not a noun. It's living. Yes. You know, so we sometimes mix that up and start to think of the goal as what's most important when in reality it's that pursuit towards the goal yeah. uh, is where our life actually occurs. That's where it's happening. Right. But right. my mind goes to the media, and we've talked about this in the past, and those ideal images that we see, which in reality, actually, you know, the actors in those images don't even look that way. Yeah, I think of the models life. in the magazines, yes. and they're so yes. airbrushed that they don't even look like themselves. <laughs> exactly. And that's yeah. so hard. As a young person, I can remember that pressure to try to look that certain way, right, and be that certain way. And truth be told, I don't fit into society's ideal idea of what a woman looks like, right? And I don't. I think very few. I think sure 2%. anyone does. That, that's the exact right. point, that we've created these images where they're not even in a way human images anymore. Exactly. The human being doesn't even fit our ideal human image. Uh, and uh, you mentioned it, it is, it's very damaging uh, to our individual self-esteem, yes. feelings of self-worth, uh, individual attitudes and beliefs, uh, how we view ourselves. And if we're honest about it, I mean, we don't have to look too far historically, the ideal continues to shift. I mean, I think of the ideal female in today's society, the image that's depicted in magazines, on television, on uh, the internet, uh, our various external sources. And then compare it to the images, let's say from the Renaissance period, as you're walking through an art gallery and you look at what the ideal female exactly. appeared, you know, this was by today's standards, an obese female. Mm -hmm. and, but it was ideal because it showed that she was well fed and they had prosperity and they associated uh, the real thin female um, with Scarcity. lack of mm -hmm. success, yeah. lack of wealth, lack in many cases even of power and fame. The famous became this very different image depiction. So it's interesting to think how we as humans create these false images, then we buy into the false images which become damaging to our own yeah. psyche. Uh, and then we change the image, but we're really not acknowledging that all of that is a fiction yes. of sorts. It's something we've created. Right. But we spend so much try time trying to reach that ideal, oh, right? I literally looked up the latest. Well, this is actually not the latest. It goes back to 2010, but still staggering numbers. Cosmetic surgery. Mm -hmm. Cosmetic surgery industry is booming. Uh, and according to the American Society, for aesthetic plastic surgery, 9.5 million cosmetic surgical and non-surgical procedures were performed in the United States alone in 2010. Mm. And about 94% were performed on women. So although it does impact both genders, it has a more heavily impact on uh, females. Uh, mo even more alarming though, a quarter of a million American teens have had cosmetic surgery in that year alone, 2010. So now we're talking about human beings who are still developing. I mean, altering their bodies. We, they're altering their outward appearance when we don't even really know what their outward appearance is going to be yet. Uh, so there's oh, definitely I a just fixation. Got goosebumps. Yeah. yeah, there is a fixation yes. on this, and unfortunately, it becomes 
extremely damaging because quite often when we're changing our external features, it's something internal that we're dissatisfied with. And so we're already setting ourselves up for failure because it doesn't matter what I'm changing in my appearance, it's not gonna fix we're what's going, going on We're going after the symptom, not the cause, right? Exactly. So exactly. in reflecting and preparing for today's episode, I thought, when do I remember trying to reach this perfect image of how I wanted to express myself like externally? When it yeah, when did this start? So then I remembered, oh, in the fifth grade, in the <laughs> early 90s, I remember it being a struggle in the morning with my mom who, you know, bless her, she always did my hair. And she was always very patient, even though I wanted it to be perfect, it had to be perfect. So in the fifth grade, I had this very interesting hairdo with bangs that went everywhere, curled, sprayed, it had to look just so. And my mom would do her best and I'd look in the mirror, nope, it's not just so. <laughs> so she would go back and tease it and spray it. And I brought a picture, it's not the best quality, but here is my hair in the fifth oh, grade. That is so, just so. <laughs> all right, it was just so and I thought it looked perfect. Well, let me tell you, I'm looking at it now <laughs> And I'm not as satisfied with that <laughs> hair too well, I as I was back in the, the big hair day at the time. I could compete with that. Yeah. So at the time, this was my perfect, right? And and it changes and shifts as we try to then reach another goal. I'm obviously not doing my hair like this now, but the struggle and the resistance against anything short of this caused a lot of turmoil for me internally, but also with my relationship with my mom who was doing her best with her, her comb and her hairspray and the teasing. And it was, you know, it was a big ordeal in the mornings growing up to look like this. And you know what's really fascinating? <laughs> when we think about our loved ones, um, you know, now we're both mothers and so we have children of our own, uh, or a, a spouse or a significant other that's in your life. If you were to list the features, and even the physical features that you find most endearing, uh, it tends to be the things that set them apart, that individualize them, yes. not the perfect image that society is setting out. Exactly. You know, and, and we're not even getting into the internal part, which is really where a lot of those deeper bonds and meaningful bonds occur. But even in a surface uh, look at the other human being, uh, we tend to strive for perfection, which tends to also be a conformity of sorts. Um, but at the same time, pushing against that, we want to be individuals. Mm -hmm. We want to stand out. We want to be different. And it's those features that other individuals tend to remember, not that closeness to the perfect image uh, yeah. for so many individuals that are striving for that. Yeah, such a good point. So, what I think in a very different context, we've been talking about humans, but uh, one of my fondest memories from the holiday uh, seasons was our annual Christmas tree. Now, when I was growing up, we always had a live Christmas tree, mm -hmm. uh, but my parents were frugal, and so we never bought a live Christmas tree, and uh, I grew up in the Allegheny Mountains of Pennsylvania, uh, and we had some acreage uh, around our property. Uh, my father had planted two rows of pine trees, so we had plenty of pine trees. And when the holidays would roll around, that was the time to select a tree that was, in a way, the perfect tree, <laughs> not for the holidays, but to be removed from yes. the Yes, okay, okay. So, so you weren't looking for the perfect Christmas tree, no. in a sense, you were looking for what tree do we need <laughs> yeah, to take down? Should, we're not gonna miss, you <laughs> okay. know, after the holidays. Yeah. So we had some interesting trees. We had many Charles Brown, Charlie Brown trees, many yeah. of those. My favorite tree, however, is what we have affectionately labeled, my siblings and I now, as the half tree. <laughs> uh, we had this one tree that was completely dead on the entire one half of it. There were no needles left at all on it. The other half was this beautiful green spruce, it looked gorgeous, but it was only half a tree. You had to position it just so, right? <laughs> father brings it in, and of course we never knew oh. what to expect when the tree was coming in. And he sets it up against the wall in our living room and, it, and decorate it, it looked beautiful, but it literally, it fit great up against the wall because it was only half a tree. And he cut off all of the dead parts, so it went very snugly up against the wall. I grew up in a little German town, uh, St. Mary's, Pennsylvania, that has a Bavarian history to it. 
And one of our local customs is what's called treeing. And so every year at the holiday time, um, families took great pride in decorating their trees. And then you would go from household to household over about a two week period, which became a little stress ridden for most of the adults. Children loved it. Um, because you were going around to look at everyone else's tree and then they came to see your tree. And there were lots of little goodies. Uh, sweets that were shared with the children at each of these households. What a beautiful tradition. Oh, it, was, it was fun but it was stressful because yeah. <laughs> we had to hit everyone and they had to hit you so you might be at someone's house visiting for a half hour and then they're coming down to your house immediately following. So you're that. racing back so to get home to welcome everyone in. Uh, but as individuals would come to our house to see our trees and we became one of the highlights because you never knew <laughs> what, what you were going to get. You were going to get. Um, the year of the half tree, and a number of individuals literally ask, well, where's the rest of the tree? And my aunt, again, sweet, sweet lady, had asked my father, it's like, where's the other half of the tree? He goes, well, it's in the kitchen, which was on the flip side. She went and looked. She went around to went see on the other side the of the wall. Those are the memories that are the yes. most vivid for us as children. Those were the perfect Yes. Trees. Okay, so I love that you told this story and you had no clue that I also prepared a Christmas tree story because when we first moved into our new home, it's not that new anymore, we've been there for three years, all of a sudden we went from a home with no acreage to a home that had some backyard woods. So I had this wonderful idea Family, let's go hiking in our woods Looks on our own movies, property. <laughs> yes, and let's find our tree. So I actually brought some pictures, and here is my family hiking into our backyard woods <laughs> on this magical day to get our family Christmas tree. And we got up a little ways on this path, and I'm looking around, looking around. I don't see Christmas trees. <laughs> <laughs> so my partner Brian said, Jess, are you for real? Did you actually think we were going to find a perfect Christmas tree out here? And I said, well, not perfect, but something that actually looks like a Christmas tree to me. <laughs> so we found one, and though it wasn't perfect, it was actually the top of one of our trees that looked like it wasn't doing that great anyway, so we felt okay going with your theory of mm -hmm. this probably needs to come down in time anyway. So we cut it down, and again, it feels magical, and I'm looking at this picture right now, and it looks pretty great of a tree, right? It looks say, that's beautiful. That's idealistic. We're going out as a family. To it get was our an tree. experience, and our children are still talking about this experience <laughs> of the day. It brought us all so much joy. Well, we get this closer to the home, and we realize this is not going to actually fit inside, right? It's going to, <laughs> it's not going to clear the ceiling. So Brian then had to cut it a little bit more and cut Did it this cut way. The top or the bottom? Well, he cut the we bottom off because we needed the years. top. <laughs> However, let me tell you now, this picture doesn't do it justice. It was funnier than this. <laughs> it was <laughs> turned out to be very full and sporadic at the top and pretty thin on the bottom. So it wasn't my idea of the perfect family Christmas tree. And I sat back looking at it and I just burst into laughter. <laughs> which then gave permission to our children to burst out in laughter. And we found so much joy in this tree. It's, it is the epic tree that we all still talk about. We put up our tree this past Christmas season and we looked at it and we thought, it's nice, but it's not that backyard Christmas tree that we had. Mm -hmm. And not only did we enjoy a lot of laughter among the five of us, our neighbors, our friends, our family who came in, they too got a huge kick out of it. It's a gift that keeps giving. It <laughs> was a gift that keeps giving. And people are still talking about this tree. So it certainly didn't meet my expectation of perfect. But if I look back on some of our happiest moments as a family, this was one of them. Well, and when we think about it, part of what's thrusting that in your memory to this prized position is the experiences yes. that went along with it. It's not really the final product. You know, I mentioned that we had many Charlie Brown trees as well. <laughs> yeah. uh, the worst of the Charlie Browns, or the best, depending upon how you define it, because it would probably be the best by Charlie Brown standards, <laughs> was this really small tree. Uh, it was the opposite impact that you had where you brought it in and said, oh, it doesn't fit. It looked a lot bigger. When outside, it was outside. So it came in. And when we brought it inside, it was tiny. Like it could have fit on this tabletop with many <laughs> feet to spare. And it had like 
I, I believe maybe five branches to it, if that, and four, <laughs> four of them probably, if you put anything on it, wasn't going to hold an ornament. So you had to be selective in which ornaments you put on that and tree. <laughs> my mother brought, we had, of course, the heritage ornaments. We had boxes and boxes of ornaments. So we have all these ornaments laid out around this tree. My father's trying to make the tree more robust, so he puts <laughs> a box under a couple crates and wraps blankets around it, so now it's higher, but it's literally this tiny tree. And I have three siblings, so there's four children now going to decorate this tree, which is at best going to handle one ornament. <laughs> And we weren't oh. sure who should put the ornament. We were afraid of breaking the tree yeah. because it was so fragile looking. Yeah. The so lightest finally, ornament possible. <laughs> my older brother, oh. oldest in the family, picks up one single bulb and he hangs it at the top of the tree. It looked like the sturdiest part of this tree. And the whole tree just oh, no. bent over. And that was the one year that my mother, the only year actually, my mother sent my father back out. Like, it will not do <laughs> another order. tree. But we didn't get rid of the tree. We kept that tree and then added another tree That's beside so great. it. But it was the experiences. We laughed so hard in all the preparations leading up to which ornament would be the one ornament. <laughs> And then when we finally selected an ornament, it also didn't work. Yeah. You know, but we still retell the story because of the experiences attached to it. What a great memory. Yeah. Now, as I was looking at the research, though, uh, there's one study, and it's actually been quoted quite a bit uh, around this topic area, that drew the conclusion that beauty, so this external image, actually does make people happier. Uh, it's the only study I could find that drew this conclusion, but this was a study done at the University of Texas. Uh, the researcher was Daniel, uh, I believe it's pronounced Hammermesh, mm -hmm. uh, and what he's suggesting is that good-looking people, and he's got good-looking in quotes, uh, are happier than plain-looking people. And the study itself collected measurements from economists in four countries. So it was conducted in the United States, Canada, Germany, and the United Kingdom. Uh, it wasn't able to track down, though, how many numbers were involved in each of those countries. Um, but it suggested that the more attractive a person was, uh, they made more money and tended to have more successful spouses. And by success, again, he was defining it according to wealth. Therefore, the conclusion was drawn, they were happier. Uh, now again, in tying this to what we know about the happiness research uh, in a more holistic way, uh, money doesn't necessarily correlate with increased happiness. It can. Up to a point. Up to a point. But it also depends what are they using the money for. If they're buying experiences, you're probably going to see a more direct correlation. Uh, but if they're buying stuff, material possessions, then it's only going to work up to, again, the latest numbers for the United States are roughly about $75,000 in an annual salary. Um, so it will increase happiness up to a point, but defining wealth and increased wealth as the sole determinant for increased happiness uh, is a little misleading. The other thing that, as I was looking at, and I'd like to dig a little deeper into this particular study, um, that I found interesting is uh, it spoke very little to the difference between the secondary variables versus the primary mm -hmm. variables. Um, if in fact uh, individuals that are being labeled within the study as more attractive, because that was my first problem, is how that's being defined. Um, as we've already discussed, it would have to be within a certain time period, almost like a societal norm for beauty or uh, attractiveness, like what does that mean? Right, because like you said, that changes over time. It changes. Yeah. And there have been some pretty comprehensive looks at how human beings view beauty, hmm. uh, but with very little success uh, finding va variables that would go across uh, the globe. Um, we do seem as human beings to prefer symmetry over asymmetry, even though there are exceptions to that. You know, so we, there's not like a hard, fast, a perfect ideal to this. But even if we can get a clear denotation of what good looking is meant in this study, I would venture uh, to guess that if those that are being attributed as being good looking are scoring higher, it's not necessarily that factor that's causing it. It's the other things that are coming in their society with that label. 
So for example, uh, if these individuals are making more money than individuals that aren't fitting their categorization of good looking, then if there may be a, almost like a circular effect happening where individuals who are now in supervisory positions have bought into what is the ideal or perfect image. Yeah. So they're selectively hiring who's getting those jobs. Well now, if I have a certain level of wealth or income that my needs are met and the majority of my basic wants are met, what may look like, oh, money's making me happier, it's not really money, it's the freedom to have opportunities that others may not have. Right. And so we would have to really, in a way, peel this onion back yeah. to see what the true Dive variables are. Dive more deeply are. into that. But I want to at least mention it because it's not without any sort of support out there. There are some mm -hmm. studies that say, oh, this physical appearance matters. Uh, and I would tend to surmise it probably matters to the extent that we allow external events to uh, impact our happiness. Right. So our own personal attitudes, our self-esteem, our... Uh, ideas and thoughts and even our actions that follow from those if I'm curbing those and playing into what society wants then it probably is having a direct impact on my level of happiness if I'm not and uh, what a lot of the psychologists refer to as the more mature uh, psyche uh, the one that is resilient the one that can uh, push back uh, when they're being fed external messages that don't fit who they view themselves as. The yes. individual who's truly comfortable in their own skin and values who they are and want to be. Uh, that that resilience tends to have a stronger correlation with how happy the individual is um, than the external factors. Um, because again, it's 40% of our inner psych psychological states that mm -hmm. impact happiness, only 10% of the external circumstances. So we can push back, we can shut that down if it is having a greater impact on us than it should. Than it should. That is so, so interesting. And I wonder too the extent that someone that doesn't necessarily fit into that ideal feels perhaps isolated, doesn't, you know what I mean? I feel like that type of experience has a negative effect on the connection piece right. and, and feeling that sense perception. of belonging. And it could be a perception. Yeah. So I gotta tell you, I had one of my top five proudest parenting moments yesterday. Oh. And I couldn't wait to tell you, so I'm gonna tell you on the air. So my seventh grader was playing in his basketball game. And at the very end of the game, he didn't get in until the second half because He's a seventh grader and the eighth graders get the playing time and it's with Campton who attempts to be one of our rivals and they are amazing at basketball. So Noah didn't get into the second half and then he's in and they're playing and right at the, the mark where there's like two minutes left in this basketball game, the other team puts in a student who has special needs and it is clear that his team is just embracing him and cheering him on and Noah is guarding this student. So, and so much taller. You know Noah, he's pretty petite. Right. So, so much taller. And I see Noah backing off. He's not guarding him. What, you know, and I thought, is he intimidated because this student is so tall? But no, he sensed that his, the teammates, the student's teammates kept throwing him the ball. They wanted to support him in getting a shot. Something larger was in Yes, play. so I'm watching my son back off and I thought, oh, perhaps the coach said, hey, listen, this is what's going on. We're gonna, you know, make sure that this student has a time to shine. Well, it was still a proud moment, right? Because just before the buzzer, the final buzzer, this young man got a shot and it went in and the crowd erupted. It was such an amazing moment. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it right now. Well, we get in the car to go home and Noah says to me, before I even have a moment to react, mom, was not a great moment? And I said, Noah, it was such a great moment. Did coach tell you guys to lay off a little bit? And he said, no, coach didn't say that, but I could see what was going on and I felt like their team, that student, deserved that moment. And I had to pull over because I was getting emotional. And I said, this is so wonderful that you realize that in that circumstance, what would be perceived as perfect, perhaps, would be to play your best, to not let up, to defend that player. But you chose a different path. That's and in wonderful. a sense, it created this most beautiful and meaningful moment for every single human being in that court. And 
it was amazing, the, the, the power and the positive energy in that gymnasium. And it's those meaningful moments that we remember. Yes. And those are the ones that have the greatest impact on yes. the level of happiness. It was, it was amazing. Well, what so. a great story to end on. I see we're out of time. <laughs> um, but the lesson really to remember as we think about perfectionism uh, in light of our own individual happiness is that there really isn't this ideal, perfect model out there. We as individuals can create our ideal, but even that becomes a little dangerous and right. counterproductive to our own happiness. Uh, that what we need to remember is life is happening between the goals and not at these perfect goal points that yes. we set for ourselves. So thank, thank you for joining us. <laughs>